I want you to get together. So what you, what have you been up to lately? <laughs> I've been I know I've been busy. I haven't heard from you for a while, but I know you were quite active a, a few years ago. So yeah, well, um, when we last talked was 2016, I think. So it's been a long time actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's been that Please long, I know, I know. Um, well, in that t- I had to take five years off, unfortunately. My uh, my workplace found out about my channel and said I can't be a manager and have a YouTube channel, so I had to kind of dis- disappear. Oh. I know, I know. Um, but I'm, since then, at the start of this year, I am self-employed now as a photographer, a wedding photographer. Yep. Um, so I'm back to do what I want to do, and I'm just back at the game again. Yeah. And uh, it's, been a good, it's been good, actually. I've, I've had a lot of support and re- back yeah. about the nephilim clown stuff yeah um i'm writing the book on that now i'm halfway Excellent. through and Excellent. Uh, that's an underexplored topic so okay. um, i was uh when you know that's why you know when we hooked up i was, was kind of happy that somebody was actually digging into that because it was just it's, you know but at this point in time, you know, and at that point in time, for me to sort of really get into it or write a book on it or something, it was not really sort of in my sights. Or so, yeah, I'll be, I'll look forward to to your book because uh, I have a big interest in that. And maybe I have a sort of one of those out there books I want to do maybe down the road in a number of years that I could maybe fold some some stuff into like different kinds of nephilim and things like that. And yeah fold this in because it kind of is a different aspect to the nephilim narrative it is it's it's a very niche it's a very niche subject um and i seem to have found myself in it um after i made my original series about it just initially poking scratching into the idea um somebody else kind of picked it up and it, the, the idea kind of took off and it got really big yeah yep. and they made it a few short- that kind of disappeared then after yeah it kind of went quiet yeah and when i came back i just thought i went full force with the whole thing because even though i was gone for yeah. five years i didn't stop researching yeah. for five years you know and it's it's I'm, I'm on the podcast circuit right now i'm going around doing all sorts of things yeah, I, I, yeah. yeah I've, i'm pretty much booked up every weekend now for like the next three months uh yeah, yeah that's that's good because uh and it, it, you know if you can keep it going but then if you're doing that it's hard to do your own podcast because i know it takes time to do that as well yeah well i i, I squeeze one in quickly before i talk to you today <laughs> quickly so that's fine <laughs> yeah um i usually do it sundays but that's, it seems to be sunday everyone wants to do a podcast um yeah. so i don't mind my, my viewers don't mind because i was i get to share that with them um, but no, it's, it's been good, and um, we don't have to talk about the clown stuff today. It's, this is about you, you know. You can talk about anything you want to talk about. Sure, sure. <laughs> well, well uh, you're you're the guest of honor, as it is, and obviously um, you're yeah. writing another book, so people are excited about this. It should be coming out October, November. I think I read. Well, it, it's it's already, but it won't be. It's uh, official release date's going to be March twelfth, so we can talk about that a little bit as well. So. Hopefully, I'll have books to send out to people before, but that with Amazon, you have to give a date that you can live by because if you don't, it, it really punishes the publisher on every book that they publish because they control so much of the market. So, And what's causing the delay is, which, I mean, it took a little bit longer to do the editing, but um, there's a shortage of paper. Hmm. There's a shortage of printers because the large companies after COVID bought up all of the smaller printers. Hmm. So there's a bottleneck there with printing. And then there's a shortage of labor. So it's in the queue. Should be printed and available before. And certainly the uh, digital version could be released instantly. But again, because it's Kindle, Amazon will control whether or not they want to release the uh, digital version early or not. or uh, and so it's, once it's in the queue, it's then it's just a matter of does Amazon want to sell it? And say we're going to um, <laughs> take inventory at that point in time because it's it, they've already. I was surprised though they already put it on the uh, on, on the website, so it's got both books listed with the second one release date for March twelfth. So it's kind of that's I'm gonna have to get ahead of that one. <laughs> so have you uh, gone self-published then? <laughs> with Amazon is that how you're doing it this time no no I use a, a deep river publishing deep, deep river because yeah and the reason why I use a publisher is uh, the big markets the US uh, I mean Europe would be a big market if I was closer but the shipping cost is there and I do ship to my own books over there but 
shipping into the U.S. from Canada, where I live, is very, very expensive. So my book is expensive. So this one, you know, the last book was twenty nine ninety nine, and they moved it up the price to about thirty four, and then it's twenty five dollars to ship to the U.S. So if somebody wants a signed copy, they're they're going to pay a lot of money for my book. So. Uh, I need somebody who can do the distribution, and I sell way more books through Amazon and other outlets that the publisher and their distributors take the book market through. Hmm. Interesting. I'm I'm learning a thing or two listening to you here. That's all. <laughs> yeah. If you want, if you want to be really, I mean, you can make more money by selling it all yourself, in terms of in an, in an individual book, but you can't sell enough. Yeah. Right? So. Yeah. <laughs> that's why. And and uh, if if you. Talk to a lot of publishers. Ship, you know, for me, when I do a book up, because my market isn't very large in Canada, but it's around the world. I mean, I have to package it. You know, um, I have to do a receipt. I've got it. I have to do a shipping notification, uh, and I have to do custom papers for it. So, <laughs> yeah, do I make more margin on it? Yes, but I would rather probably not <laughs> sign copies. But it's part of the doing it right there were people who want to support the author who want to sign copy so that's why i do it I, but you know from a and i do it i you know it's not that i i hate doing it because you got to be into what you're doing it's just that it takes so much time so yeah. well i'm glad i'm not shipping all of the books myself no well I, on on that i've i have a pre-order system i have a gofundme to help with the book um and yep. so far i have i think i have about 30 people who have pre-ordered for a signed copy um yep. and the money's there for it. I've kept it to one because they donate a hundred. Yeah. I save about right. forty per person just to, for the shipping costs and paying for the book right. and everything. Yeah. Uh, so I understand what you're saying. I've got a few to send out myself when the book's finished, and probably a lot more <laughs> yet. But uh, it's it's worth it's worth it because the people care enough to actually support yeah. support it in that way. And like I said, with your own work, I know you, you're you're a bit of a rock star now in terms of the uh, the, the Nephilim subject. So everyone's, I'm sure your book's gonna just go crazy when it comes out. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm expecting it's going. I know we're not. We should probably be talking about this live, but yeah, I'm expecting a lot better takeoff than the first one. It was a, a big push on the first one. Well, because it, it was groundbreaking work in in of itself. You were, like I said, a Christian contrarian. The stuff you were saying was not going to be so readily just accepted by the community. You know, um, it, I, I'm, <laughs> it wasn't. I'm in the. I know. I know. I, I'm in the conspiracy community myself. You know, and I. I yeah. In my own book, I've referenced yours quite heavily in the first few chapters because it's basically an abridged biblical history, just to give a context for who the Nephilim are before I go on to describe yep. what they look like. Yeah. And, you know, I was reading a lot of your book to get this and I can see you you're kind of fighting in that book to, to reiterate the points you're making clearly yeah. because, you know, people yeah. are going to come up with certain counterpoints straight away from the churchianity yeah. perspective, you know. When you're into controversial stuff, uh, and I knew this from, uh, you know, just sort of being aware of what happens in the world with people, is that if you don't cover off as much of the loose ends as possible, they will uh, get out there and be uh, with their connections because they don't want the information coming out. You'll be, you know, blackballed and not, you know, and discredited without being able to actually counter it so yeah you know my publisher says why don't you write a shorter book and i said, and I said because i want to do as much argument solving up front that, that's well that's what my book's turning into I like i, I didn't yeah. think i'd be writing a 500 page tome but i'm already like yeah. i'm already like 100 pages in and i've barely scratched the surface and it's kind of like i don't maybe maybe because i'm doing about the clowns i should just shorten it a little bit and make it a bit more pocket size but uh right now i'm just covering everything every question yep. every argument i can imagine sure. you've just got to get it yeah you can edit it back like the first book i was almost 1200 pages before i took it down to 800 <laughs> <so>. <laughs> wow i'd like I'd, I'd like to see those missing 400 pages or maybe are those 400 pages going to be in your new book is that what's going on here some some is some is yeah Right. So but, there's, there's okay. Go, so I was thinking maybe we no, go ahead. let's just start doing it. Let's go through your book. Let's start going through because sure. you've already laid out. I have a picture here um, from Facebook a while ago. You made a post explaining yeah. in August the layout of your book, the table of contents. Yeah. And it looks yeah. heavy. It looks like it's going to be just as big as the first book, to be honest. <laughs> this looks like a. How many chapters have you got laid out here? 84 it's chapters? Only, it's only 84 this time. <laughs> oh, only 84. Yeah, he says. Um, but I'm reading some of the titles of these chapters and it's like, I don't even know where to begin, Gary, to, to interview you with this because it's just, 
so much. So how about we just do it section by section? Maybe you can give us an sure. overview yeah. for the listeners of, of what sure. each section of your book will be about. Yeah. So section yeah. one, uh, giants, demons, and angels. Let's go. Are you good? Did you want to do an introduction? Are you going to do your own introduction for the show later? or No, I'm, I'm just going to, the way I do it, Gary, with everybody, yeah. it's a conversation. You know, okay. people get okay. up, people get upset about, but this is an is, this isn't an interview. We're just going to talk. Um, okay. Let's just talk about section yeah. one. You know, go. Let's go. Yeah. So uh, I have a I have a book out that people are I think talk starting to talk about a little bit. It's called the Genesis Six Conspiracy Part Two. Obviously, there's a part one, mm-hmm. and I have a you know a generous excerpt on all eighty four chapters up on my website right now. Just like I have a generous excerpt on all ninety eight chapters for the first book. And I want people to get a good feel for the book because it's going to be controversial just like the first book. And it's going to be as unique as the first book. So in the uh, first uh, section, it's called Giants, Demons, and Angels. And this is uh, a book that is designed to do a number of different things. You know, because I said I would never write a sequel to the Genesis 6 conspiracy because I, I, I didn't want to be redundant. So what I didn't what I didn't realize and it didn't sort of hit me until I was well into it because I I have another book I'm 300 pages into before I stop to do this book. Mm-hmm. But I do a lot of social media and a lot of interviews and people get a hold of me. I do shows just with questions and This is what I didn't anticipate was in the Christian community. One, it's very controversial in the Christian community. It says it is outside the Christian community, the first book. Mm -hmm. But the audience within the Christian community who are starting to wake up to this notion and that their churches, our churches don't uh, teach the whole Bible. In fact, they leave out most of the Bible and that's prehistory and prophecy and they don't teach the context for the doctrines that they do a good job of laying out in the churches, but they don't provide uh, context. And so what I learned was there's this incredible thirst out there that there's something missing in what they're being taught, and it's from the Christians. And there's a lot of Christians who have been taught that giants don't exist and that uh, it's just a group a significant exaggeration and then is built on other exaggerations and misinformation that becomes disinformation and on and on and on and on. So for me to, uh, you know, if I wanted to move, let's say my second book to another publisher and actually my publisher looked at it because they, they thought a bigger publisher would probably do a better job on this is in the Christian community. They don't want to touch anything to do with Genesis six. So, but I have a, the first publisher and we're going to move forward based on that because we can do the marketing between the publisher and myself just as we did on the first book and we have the distribution so that's all in place and so this book is targeted specifically at christians now doesn't mean you have to be a christian to read it but for christians who uh, want to know everything from a biblical perspective what it has to say about giants angels, and demons, and prophecy, this is for them. Now, if you're a non-Christian and you want to know more about giants than what you ever knew about before, you're really going to love this information because it's not taught in Christianity. It's not taught outside of Christianity. So this book is as unique as the first one and will be as controversial, but this book is designed to provide the information for you up front, right there. So instead of having the end notes at the end, I have footnotes and they're on the same page. And in the first book, uh, I had over 100 pages of end notes because I wanted people to uh, check the veracity and dig into these things themselves and look at my bibliography. This book, the bibliography, and the end notes, which are now footnotes, are even stronger. So in the first book, I would let the polytheist side and the secular sides speak for themselves in their own words. But this one's specifically targeted for Christians. So I wanted to use um, most of the sources that are biblical and then use 
only outside sources where it lines up sort of absolutely perfectly for uh, an understanding of the world, both before, now, and coming, mm -hmm. um, that they can also relate to. And so I will use like the Ugaritic texts, for example, because, and we'll probably talk a little bit more of those as we go through the show, because it is written in Semitic, which is the root language for Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And so you can take it back back to vowelless Semitic and also vowelless Hebrew if you want. And I do that a little bit. And I can show the etymology of the words and I can make a connection. And it talks about the same groups of people in the Ugaritic text, which is a post-Diluvian uh, accounting of giants. Now, it has references to the antediluvian with the parent gods. But it's mostly about the offspring gods and the Baalim of Mount Saphon, which is Mount Hermon in the Ugaritic text. So it talks about the Raphaim as being giants, kings, and healers mm -hmm. and uh, with bloodline dynasties and a council of the Datanu, as, as it's called. So that's the type of sourcing that I'll lay down because it rhymes up perfectly with the etymology for Raphaim, which goes back to RPM. And has all the same meanings as Rapha, which are post diluvian giants in the Bible. So this book's going to talk mostly about the post diluvian giants, uh, which I didn't cover a lot in, in, in the first book, but it was the bloodlines that I covered. So this is going to be that gap sort of in the middle as well. So uh, in the first section, what I'm doing is, is taking on some of the information that people uh, need in terms of how do we know the giants have veracity mm -hmm. and accuracy and how do we know that in the bible that it has that type of veracity and, and accuracy and i'm providing that information so that if you're a christian you can take it back to your minister and say here's all the information and sourcing of it and the details that's in the sourcing i put a lot of detail in the footnotes so way more information and i go directly to those sources so i have a lot of ancient sources as well and so when i'm talking about the days i open up with the days of noah and lot and this is important because we're talking about the end time in prophecy, as Jesus gave us as one of the overarching signs for the fig tree generation, it'll be like the days of Noah and Lot, which is both sides of the flood. Because mm -hmm. Noah lived 950 years, 600 before the flood, 350 after the flood. And then Sodom, from the biblical side, was a city after the flood. Although you'll get Sodom and Gomorrah from an antediluvian perspective as well. But... And they're likely the same cities just rebuilt, but understand you have to, if you're going to understand prehistory, you have to understand the difference between offspring gods, parent gods, the flood, and that the offspring gods live after the flood. And they take over for the parent gods who have been sent to the abyss or the pit prison for the crimes that they uh, did before the flood, which included creating the giants, the Nephilim. It's described in Genesis 6, 4. And that in polytheism, the offspring gods overthrow the parent gods because they're no longer there. So mm -hmm. it's like they're dead, but it's an allegory because you can't kill something that's immortal. But no. you can put them in a prison design to keep the immortals. And the Baalim will go there and the offspring gods will go there as well. That's which is why they only walk amongst humans for a certain period of time after the flood. And they do the same crimes. That's why they end up going there. And so once we start to understand that it is the offspring gods that rule after the flood, we can start to make that distinction between what happened before and after the flood. And you can take accounts from all over the world and start to assign that. So Baal in the Bible is the son of El. El's the parent god. And all of his accompanying gods in the Canaanite pantheon, which are replaced by the Baalim that are recorded in the Ugaritic text. As another example for people, you can have in uh, the Greek mythology, for example, which most people are, are, are more familiar with, is you have uh, you know, gods like Kronos or Uranus as a parent god. Yeah. And Zeus is his offspring god that rules after the flood. Mm -hmm. And so the Olympian gods after the flood with Zeus, like Poseidon, 
um, our offspring gods, and then you have like Gaia and Iapetus and gods that are before the flood. So if you can identify the parent gods from the offspring gods, you can now understand Greek history because you have names that are used both before and after the flood. So you have to be able to distinguish that, and you have to distinguish that some of the mythos of to let's say like gods like Iapetus are inherited by gods who replace them after the flood like Poseidon. Mm -hmm. So then you have, that's why it's important to understand that when you hear the Iapetus story, it's not just a different name for the same god. It has an inheritance value to it because the flood happened before Poseidon takes over, but he is assigned in Greek mythology as the god of Atlantis, which was destroyed by the flood. Mm -hmm. So you can see why you have to understand that. Another quick example on it, I know I'm going a long time before even getting into the first section, oh, no. but just go. setting the table, go, go. Um, fine. is you have uh, Gilgamesh in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and I go directly to the sources of both in the Ugaritic text, which has its own version of the Epic of Gilgamesh, plus a couple of versions in Sumeria, and quote from those texts directly, and we'll take words right back to the original Sumerian and Mm -hmm. uh, Semitic texts in both, so that we get the true me true meaning and understanding, and then how how, the, how that comes forward into what we understand for those tales and in, into the modern language. So Gilgamesh is created six generation after the flood. Yeah, as you go through the kings list, and so he's son of Lugalbanda, who's a giant king as well. Lugal being giant king, and he's the offspring of the fertility goddess. Nin or Nin Sun, depending on which transliteration or translation that you're reading. And so this is a demigod giant who is created after the flood, becomes king of Uruk. He's like 19 feet tall on a royal cubit and seven feet wide and a dark haired sort of variety with a dark curly beard variety. So extremely wide or stout, which I cover off in the book in great detail from a biblical perspective and taller than the giants that are the red hair and blonde haired ones described in the land of, and of the covenant mm -hmm. after the flood. Whether or not they were larger than the ones before the flood, don't really know. Um, but we do know is there there was both red haired, blonde haired, and dark haired ones before the flood. Mm -hmm. So again, probably linking back to watchers who were promoted that went back and recreated from the same sort of strains and so Enkidu is looks just like Gilgamesh yeah same description same mother goddess and you also have Atma Tishtin who is the Noah of yeah. the Sumerian story or the Sumerian Noah but he's two-thirds god and one-third human as well just as Gilgamesh and Enkidu are so he's a giant as well, and an archetypical giant survived the flood story. So that's a story about the survival of giants, not humans. Yeah, it's the last. It he's a, the last of king, wasn't he? Wasn't he the last king of the yeah, last, last of king. king at the time of the flood? Yeah, yeah. So you get that link. So you're getting a survival story there and a second incursion story there. That's right. Which is interesting because you you get the uh, second incursion story out uh, of the Ugaritic text but not necessarily out of the Ugaritic text before the flood. But in the Greek text, you get two kinds of giants that were created, one before the flood that were uh, destroyed in the flood and the wars, uh, and the ones that are created after the flood, like from Zeus, who's an offspring god who creates Hercules. Mm -hmm. So if that name Hercules is named after another giant, some people transliterate as Heracles. So again, we have to be careful which side of the flood and which name that we're applying that to. The same thing, I'll just finish and I'll let yeah, you yeah, in because yeah. I got on a long rant. Sure, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and Gilgamesh is recorded in the Book of Giants, yes. which is before the flood and yeah. is anticipating the flood mm -hmm. and is killed by the flood. And so he... The second incursion story is somebody that's named after that giant before the flood. So we need to understand those crossovers to understand prehistory. Do you think a lot of these name repeated names before and after flood was done intentionally to confuse the history? Do you think there may be a yes. bit of a conspiracy well, with that? Because they inherit the titles, they want to inherit the mythos. And that's mm -hmm. a common practice amongst the demigods. Yeah. 
that they are the divine representatives of their godfathers, the celestial mafia, as I like to refer to them as, mm -hmm. the Nephilim, um, as opposed to Nephilim, yeah. which I, I, I explain in, in the book as well, um, is that they, they are not only the spurious offspring, but have been provided the divine right to rule both yeah. before and after the flood. So what happens both before and after the flood, these kings, because they take over the governance because of their size, obviously, uh, and create dynastic bloodlines, they are taking on not only the inherent right to rule, but will take on aspects of those gods and will call themselves those gods at times. So it gets, you have to be able to separate the demigod aspect and then the overlay of the god. And that's why a lot of people will raise a lot of the demigods, you know, up to god status. They are an inferior god, right? Yeah. And, and became mortal, which we also talk about uh, in this book and in, and in the first book. Just to pick your brain a bit about Greek mythology, um, one thing that I thought was fascinating in the Book of Enoch, how it talks about the fate of the women who mated with the angels and they they became sirens, is what it says specifically. Yeah. And I was th thinking about Greek mythology, I was looking into sirens in general um, for my own book and just to talk about that, that period before the flood where humans kind began mixing kinds together and messing with DNA and creating hybrids out of humans not necessarily with human mate through mating of nephilim it was through some kind of genetic engineering of sorts with help from the angels that we mentioned that were still around but yeah. it, it talks in the greek mythologies of, of um that the nymphs and the sirens were allowed to sit yeah. in on the meetings of the gods yeah. in the egyptian uh, mythology whenever mount olympus had a meeting you know and all the gods got together it's like the sirens were allowed to join them even though they weren't gods themselves they were considered you know at a level and if you think of them as the wives and yeah. you know the the harems of the gods in a sense it makes sense why they were allowed you know they were they were raised to be mother goddess status yeah because they were producing in that sort of understanding a son of a god mm-hmm or a female of, of a god, depending on which gender that was born. And so through that, they were raised to that status. It took on the queen of heaven-like status, which is, again, so heavily conflated. But then you, again, you have to distinguish the queen of heavens before the flood, after the flood, and the demigods. So yeah. that the sirens are looked at as being, you know, the mother of gods. Or the mother of God, as in the sort of the Mary apparition sort of thing, as she yeah. talks about being the mother of God. And so that's one of those concepts that we have to understand that whether or not they survived the pregnancy or not, mm -hmm. um, and according to the Yes version of the of the Old Testament, Old Testament, the Keber and the Gast is the women were sacrificed with the Caesarian uh, operations, so to speak, uh, in favor of saving the demigods over the human mother. Mm. And well, then they would raise them to be mother god-like status. Yeah. And that they somehow are changed in the book of Enoch so that whatever they've done has changed their nature, corrupted their spirit, and they become, I think, Nephilim or Raphaim like because unlike humans, their bodies aren't going to sleep. Yeah. And they're going to be part of the organizational structure, part of the hierarchy, and elevated to a special status. So that's what I wanted to ask you really. What do, what do you think the deal is with these guys? And do you think that the change that happened, so they became sirens, that's kind of all we know. We're not really told yeah. how. Is it a punishment from yeah. God for doing what they did? Or is it a gift from the angels for going along and being the mothers of their children? It, what is it, it is, exactly, you know? And... I don't I haven't gotten into this in any of my books, but in, and again, because there's so many out there things that you can get into, but mm. I think you can look at how the sirens are equated with mermaids. Yeah. And other similar kinds of beings as you get into the Middle East with the, with the etymology of siren and how they come about and connections to the Queen of Heaven and things like that, you have a scenario where 
they have a body of some sort, a physical body. Mm -hmm. But nowhere in prehistory do we get an explanation that adequately says how that happened if no. they died or how they were transformed. No. Uh, so there's either an intercession to change them into that from what a human woman was and in a healing process to save them, or there was what I talk about in the new book, an Oikotarian that was created for them. And what an Oikotarian is, is, a, is defined as a dwelling place for the spirit. Right. And that's the word that is used for habitation in Jude 1 6, that the original angels left their habitation in heaven, a dwelling place for heaven, just as it's understood as a house in heaven in 2 Corinthians 5 2. For the Christians out there who want to check that, or non Christians who want to check those two verses, house in heaven, habitation, Jude 1 6 at the latter, but the first one is uh, 2 Corinthians 5 2. That goes back to Oikotarian, a dwelling place or a housing for the spirit in heaven. In 2 Corinthians, it talks about a similar sort of housing in the physical world. So for angels to procreate, they're spirit beings. Mm -hmm. So they need an oikotarian in the physical world. That's a soul and a body. So the world is made up of a spirit that comes from heaven and the soul and the body, which is of the physical world, and the spirit merges with the soul that only Jesus and God can separate which is why polytheists and seculars only talk about the soul because they don't want to recognize the spirit aspect that comes from heaven. So when the angels wanted to interact physically in the world, they needed to create their own oikotarian. They could create any gender or any look. That's where the changeling sort of doctrine comes in that uh, most polytheists are uh, sort of renowned for having, but Christians like to sort of deny. And I, I like to point out to Christians that in the Sodom and Gomorrah story, you have two angels who create an oikotarian of a human body. They're not even recognized as angels at first. Mm -hmm. They can eat, they can drink, they can touch, they can interact. And the angel of the Lord, the pre-existing Jesus, does the same thing, creates an oikotarian for himself to interact physically with the world. So if you can create your own body, and again, in the New Testament, for people who want to hold me to both Testaments all of the time, which I'm very good at countering and supplying the information on, if you ask for it. But there's in, in the book of Hebrews, there's a passage where it talks about to be kind to strangers because you may not know when you've come across an angel. So they're in a physical form in the physical world and you can't recognize them. And in other passages, you can recognize them in a physical form. So we know they can do that. And that body, soul and body will have DNA. Yeah. So they can pass on that DNA and somehow it, they pass on the counterfeit spirit to the, to the spirit's offspring, which are immortal spirits at first. Mm -hmm. uh, and which is why God steps in in Genesis 6, 3 in the Nephilim creation story to limit life to 120 years yeah. from a physical perspective. That doesn't mean their, their, their spirit dies. No. They are the disembodied spirits, which after their body died or, came, or killed, like by taking the head, and I get into that in great detail in the book in several parts and why that's important to understand. Um their bodies are, are their, their spirits are going to wander the earth. Mm -hmm. Or if they're successful and before they were beheaded um, and had enough adept knowledge within their mystical religions, they could find their way to their heaven, which is Hades or Sheol or the underworld, the, under, uh, the other world, all these different names where their gods rule from, and that they could live amongst the gods. And so in the Ugaritic text, you have them doing these funeral processions for dead kings by uh, the Raphaim, the ruling kings, to make sure they get there. And in the uh, Egyptian religion, you have them sailing on these boats into the underworld because they've successfully navigated through the mysteries to be able to get there. But if they can't get there, then they have to wander the, the earth and or they're going to be shut into the, the abyss prison along with the God fathers, the fallen angels, the Nephilim. And biblically, we get that in Ezekiel 32. They're called the terrible ones who are talking from the prisons in the sides of the pit mm -hmm. prison 
to Pharaoh, who is also a Raphaim dynastic king. And they're called the terrible ones who did terrible things to humans while they were on the earth. And when they were killed, they were slain, beheaded, shortening the story. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why they're in, in, in the pet prison. So humans sleep yeah. when we go. So ghosts and things like that, these are the disembodied spirits of the, of the Nephilim and the Raphaim. Absolutely. No, I agree with you completely. Um, I mean, it's funny because the realm I'm in, in the conspiracy world, you know, I, I talk with a lot of people who come out of the New Age um, world where they commune with spirits in the astral realms and things like that. And the most common thing that people discuss is that they interact with these entities which look like jesters. It's a really common theme, yeah. you know, um, which where my work comes into it, this whole the Nephilim look like clowns thing, you know. Yeah. Um, but when people, t you know, talk about these realms they talk about them like there's some kind of fant fantastical other world that is beyond ours which is higher than ours in some way but when i try to describe it to them i say no no what you're looking at is just the other side of this world it's still this world they are actually just in this the pipe work of this world the the coding the behind the scenes world yeah. in a sense because they don't have a body they're in, yeah, they're exactly. in, a, they're yeah. in a lesser that's state where, yeah go ahead that's where the understanding of the siren as this interesting sort of interconnection. Mm -hmm. So that if angelic technology could can create an oikatarian for them, mm -hmm. so that they can physically interact at least for a while, yeah. until those gods were taken away and obviously restricted more thereafter, because you don't see these mermaids and these female goddesses and those types of forms after a certain period of time after the flood, that sort of coincides similarly with the original gods, let's say, of Zeus and Baal and Anki and Osiris and Isis, all of those offspring gods disappear. They no longer walk amongst the humans. Mm -hmm. That disappears in a similar sort of period of time. But if you want these disembodied Nephilim, the demigods, in the end time, physically interact in the world other than let's say in other types of oikotarians like a teraphim which is a talking idol or in computer programs daemons as are yeah. sort of called in, in the lingo with ai and things like that um, which they may or may not be able to do there's lots of people who certainly believe they they can make a home in there and the teraphim model in the old testament mm. suggests that there's that kind of capability that means a talking idol yes. so there's something supernatural, preternatural going on there. They're going to create, I think, an oikotarian for these disembodied spirits in the end time. They're going to create either new giant bodies or chimera type of beings. And again, interesting, we get a chimera type of being in the Epic of Gilgamesh, mm -hmm. Epic of Gilgamesh with King Hababa of the Cedar Forest, which is Mount Hermon, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and so he's ruling from there, and he's got multiple animal parts to him. Mm -hmm. There's something different in the creation with King Hababa than there is with Gilgamesh. And I yeah. think that's that DNA manipulation that is part of that angelic technology as well. And I think we're just starting to catch up on now so that will be like the days of Noah, which they had both before and early after the flood. Well, there's one particular goddess in Greek mythology called Echidna. And she is basically yeah. a half siren female snake woman, monstrous in yeah. nature. And she uh, mates regularly with the sea god Typhon, I think his name is. And she yeah. she is the mother of many beasts and monsters, 12 of them, I think, yes. um, such as the, the Chimera, uh, the three-headed Cerberus, the Hydra. She gave birth yes. to all these monsters and creatures through basically being like a... Um, a brood mare, you know, for the for yeah. the angels to come. You described there's like a place they can put the spirit in a sense before giving them yes. a body to manifest physically to mate with, and it's described in in the Greek mythology that she's she's underground. The gods have put her underground in a special place, which is ordained in gold. It's like a palace of gold where she's kept and looked after basically because she's so precious to the gods because she births all these monsters for them basically and yep. when you're talking about like a, an essentially like a, a pocket dimension created for them to go afterwards maybe is that the parallel is that what that is and you've, you've given me some thought there as well with this description you gave yeah i think there's uh there's i mean in the occult you have all of these portals to the underworld that's in another dimension mm-hmm 
right? And also one of the abilities, if you subscribe to giants surviving the flood, that they could be in the earth, but in another dimension. Mm -hmm. and so it's thought that the underworld and, the, and is also the location of the pet prison in a different part of the underworld, but is in the earth space, but on a different sort of wavelength, so to speak, and that all of the aliens and all of uh, these things that we see that are phenomena in the world uh, that are explained, they tend to go back and forth between the portals. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, Mount Hermon has the gateway to um, the Hades, right? It has one of the most famous occult sites in, in the whole world. And that's at, you know, Mount Hermon, which was the home of the assembly of the gods, uh, the Balim. And again, you get that same sort of imagery and all the different cultures that they had this assembly of the gods, probably just a different pantheon, mm -hmm. seven holy mountains around the world as generally is the main number. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so you have this world and you have this mother goddess that's producing other types of beings. Uh, it's like the hive understanding of bees the queen bee mm -hmm. that creates with this nebulous forces uh, male forces creates all of the bees underneath and that they can communicate with telepathy which is that hive mind which is they thought that the nephilim and the raphaim had mm -hmm. that they worked as one mind yeah which helped them to do great things which you couldn't do individually so yeah there's all of these different interesting mythical stories where they create these different types of beings and then you have other kinds of beings that are created and there are different gods and goddesses that are involved in this in each of the pantheons so for example uh, you have uh, bast who creates uh, a number of types of different creatures including the black panther um uh, type of beings that are in the, the superhero movie. Yeah. Uh, the most famous one is Tiamat. Tiamat. Uh, out of the uh, Sumerian pantheon, who's a Leviathan-like creature. Because mm -hmm. all of these are, you know, basically serpentine type of uh, creatures. And she creates things like the um, scorpion beings that are described in Revelation 9. She creates uh, giants and heroes and all sorts of different kinds of creatures and you get that you know coming out of sort of the you know mixing cultures that pandora box of creation mm -hmm. out of the greek mythology that uh, plagued uh, the certainly the antediluvian world and we think by some of the similar accounts after the flood shortly after the flood as well so if someone's asked me a question to ask you actually and i suppose we're talking here about you know basically avatars in a sense in order for, for spirits to manifest physically yeah. into our world and someone someone's been asking me this question and i don't feel like i sufficiently have enough knowledge on the history of india to answer this question but where do the vamana texts and the vedic history fit into the timeline essentially you no know, so we're talking about all the hindu gods and uh, the flying machines and the wars they were having with each other. I mean, I, I see the parallels to other cultures and their own god wars, you know, and the Clash of the Titans as a parallel type of thing, but it, it seems like there's like a distinct flavor to the Indian type of story. And that, what, yeah, do, what do you think yeah, about it, that, you know? It provides details that others do not provide, mm -hmm. other cultures, other mystical religions. And there's, a, there's always this move in the secular world to try and say that these are more they're younger versions than what their people would say that they are mm -hmm. and so people you know seculars will say well the vedas there's a number whether it's up and shads or the bhagavad Gita, or there's a number of them you know when they were written and a lot of them will say a thousand bc so might even say 1500 bc but According to the, the Indian culture, it goes back way into prehistory. Mm -hmm. And we should probably take them at that. So now if we look at these wars that are going on, they're probably not anti-Diluvian wars because these are this is not a battle between powerful demigods. Mm -hmm. The names of these are actual gods. Mm -hmm. 
these are parent gods. These are powerful sort of gods. And that the destruction that they have has the ability to destroy the entire world. Yeah. Just as just as the a crab of Baloo or the Gird of Baloo or the Scorpion Men created by Tiamat to keep the offspring gods in line have the ability to destroy the world. And you get the same accounts and with from the Kishimaya as well. You know, and in the Baloo and you get descriptions of this on and uh, throughout their history, but yeah. I digress. Um, so you have this power that is beyond the demigods. This is angelic. And there's, whether or not it's the loyal angels of God biblically or the fallen ones or a war within the fallen ones, you have weapons that are being used that destroys massive amounts of the earth and people on it. Mm -hmm. We don't get that description with the flood story. We yeah. get wars and a conflagration of events, but not a planet killing perspective. But the Bible does talk about in the book of Peter, Second um, Peter, about a destruction that happens uh, that is that destroyed the earth by fire, just as fire is reserved for this end time destruction, and the world perished. Well, the flood didn't kill the whole world; it only killed what was on the land. Yeah. And this is talking about a period where. The, the, the world that was in water that uh, that was out of the water and now is in the water again. Let's paraphrase it. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to Genesis 1 now, you have with the six days of creation, you have the separations of the water that creates the firmament so that the land can dry out and you can start to have creation. So... If you look at how you can alternatively translate Genesis 1, you can say instead of the world um, was void and formless in Genesis 1, 2, you can translate that, that it became form and voidless. This is a big subject. I, I talked three and a half hours at, uh, uh, at a convention on one time and walked okay. through all of it, but I'll give a sort of a snippet as to where I'm going to answer that sort of question. Sure. Um, and that something had happened that would have maybe caused in that translation of the world became void and formless uh, sometime between Genesis 1 and 1, 2. What's interesting is you have the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters in Genesis 1, 2 before the, the days of creation in Psalms 104. When God sends the Spirit, the world is renewed. So we're possibly looking at a renewal of the earth in Genesis 1-2. Mm -hmm. And then we get these passages in throughout the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, where you know you get this, this this destruction that seems to have happened where it destroyed the world down to its foundations. Yeah. Right? That would be an event that would perish the world. Mm -hmm. And that what happens is is that I think the what to make this make sense, I think it their angelic rebellion better fits for. Yeah. So that when that world is destroyed with this angelic weaponry in a war of gods, mm -hmm. uh, with these planet destroying weapons, it's destroyed down to the foundations and, and is perished. And when that happens, the waters collapse. So just as in you have the recreation or the original creation, you have chaos needs to be separated that will create that permanent is essentially the same type of story so what's going on in genesis one is in, in with this sort of gap or renewal of the earth understanding is is that that is renewing the earth by re-separating those waters uh, so you have waters above and waters below and takes the chaos away mm -hmm. and i think that better fits where the uh where the angelic rebellion actually took place mm -hmm. and that this is a similar destruction that happened or Genesis one, two, that is coming again in the end time, mm -hmm. a destruction not seen since creation as Jesus described it in the last three and a half years of, of, of this age. And that, we have uh, an understanding of these uh, powerful angels who uh, destroyed the world. And now if we start to link that back into like 
Shiva as the destroyer god. Yeah. Uh, who has this doctrine of a renewal of the earth through complete destruction mm -hmm. and sort of look at that as a parallel being to who Azazel would be or Abaddon, Apollyon, who comes up out of the pit prison in the end time, things yeah. start to make a little bit more sense. Now, what's also interesting in the, um, in the Vedic and uh, different holy scriptures of India is, is that you have concept of avatar and avatar that you sort of led into it with. So Vishnu mm -hmm. is a parent god or a chief god, depending on where you want to place him. I would place him as a parent god by the age. But Vishnu has the ability to, or his replacement god, the ability to be the avatar of a human or a demigod. Mm -hmm. And so when you have like Buddha, had extra wisdom and was an avatar of Vishnu, things start to make sense because that's a symbiotic relation, not a hostile takeover mm -hmm. like a demon spirit does in a lot of cases, um, and adds wisdom or power to that individual. And so you also have like Shiva, who also uh, avatared, I think, a dozen times into demigods or humans, one being Narashima, that Aslan of the uh, Narnia Chronicles are, um, I think is, is, is a reflection of, of Narashima, who is the avatar of Shiva, and Narashima was a lion god that Aslan is portrayed as, as Christ would present himself in another form in another world yeah. as an incarnation. Um, New Age doctrine, but just so that people sort of understand what I'm talking about. And biblically, we know this can happen because in the time of Jesus, you have Satan entering into Judas to help him go through with his vow to betray Jesus. Mm -hmm and uh, enters into him to do that. And maybe he also enters into Nahash, the serpent, to deceive Eve in the, in the time of Eden because it's not uh, Satan who is punished, it's the serpent beings, these yeah. serpentine beings that are unaccounted for uh, for the creation of humans because they're a beast of the field. So they're created before day six. Mm -hmm. but they're intelligent, walking, talking beings. Yeah, well, so it's kind of like, a, in a way, a form of what we would call possession today, in in, in a, like a more basic form. It seems like they, ha like I said, it seems like India has like hundreds of thousands of gods. Wait, yeah. a, go a god for everything, basically, and yeah. you often see the gods depicted with many arms. And I don't think that was a depiction of how they actually looked. It's supposed to symbolize the one god doing many things, doing all the things at once. You know, making the world happen, all this kind of symbolism. But then, obviously, like. In terms of the biblical narrative, we're talking about the fallen angels and Nephilim. I would, I would obviously very quickly say they're clearly representations of fallen angels who have just really made up a wild story. It's basically to summarize it in my own mind, and it's a very confusing story. But if you, like I said, this ancient one of this huge destructive war, so you would say in the timeline, this is pre-human. We're talking like the war, the god, the war yeah. of gods, just gods alone, it's just going at it exactly. And, and if people want me to walk through Genesis 1 and how you can translate that, I have a document on that, and I'll walk you through all of the words. And it actually fits better biblically yeah. in terms of the descriptions that follow in the Bible than sort of a shorter kind of story. So now I also wanted to uh, sort of talk about um, – oh, I, I might have just lost it um, – You were, when we are talking about uh, the Vedas and – I think I lost it. If I think of it, I'll come back to it. <laughs> well, one thing that let's while we were talking about creation at the beginning, I know a big part. I think a big part of your book is to explore the idea of the um, the pre Adamic race. I think yeah. this is something again extremely controversial for Christians. It, it just is, you know. And as a, I call myself a backdoor Christian. I wasn't raised in a church. I wasn't classically yeah. trained in biblical theology. So I, I don't necessarily have like. I'm not holding on to preconceived notions as much as yeah. some Christians who are kind of raised that way. And this, this is not to cast aspersions on them for thinking that way, because it's understandable. But for me, the idea that there was a race prior to Adam being created and put in the garden, yeah. or Adam maybe even being taken from the race and just set yeah. apart from and 
groomed in a way to be a leader, you know. That makes a lot more sense to me and it answers a lot of questions very quickly. It um, certainly does. It certainly does. Do you and want to expand upon this idea and see if we're going to book well, book? Yeah. It's, a, it's an awesome thing. And I and the point I was going to talk about that sort of my just sort of evaporated from my mind there, unfortunately, <laughs> go, for go, a go, go. Is, is you're talking about the number of gods. Yeah. So in and I talk about this in the new book as well, is is that there's a host of heaven and there's a host of rebellious ones or the gods of this world. Mm -hmm. And it's a large number. Yeah. And so in the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, it says 10,000 times 10,000 are before the throne of God. That's 100 million. And in other passages, it says it's uncountable. So there's a large number of these angels and a full third of them rebel. Mm -hmm. So whether or not that's 50 million or 33 million, how you want to cal calculate that, or it's even a larger number because the 10,000 times 10,000 is just an allegorical number. There's a lot of gods and they have rank and order, mm -hmm. many different kinds of angels. And I talk about that hierarchy and the different kinds of angels and where they fit in. And, and so you've got many different kinds of angels uh, that we talk about in that I'll talk about, and then many, many numbers of these angels, and they also have these changeling capabilities. So it starts to really sort of open up your eyes as to what was going on in prehistory, if you can understand that. And another thing that helps, particularly for Christians, is that just as you were taught the standard dogma of Genesis 1, which I think an older earth fits scripture and the angelic rebellion better and also the creation of dinosaurs that look just like the seraphim who are the main protagonists sort of uh, amongst these creating illicit creatures they're serpentine dragons from heaven mm -hmm. they have serpent faces yeah. and they're creating beings that look just like them just as these dinosaurs are now depicted more with feathers than without feathers just, and that Sarah from her six wings, six wings. So mm -hmm. that sort of fits better. And also, if you look at from a biblical perspective on what it says about Adam, is we only get 6,000 years in his genealogy. But what we don't get is uh, an understanding of how that sort of links in with kind of an older world. Well, the first thing is, is that in, in Genesis... Um, two when adam is created it has completely different details than mm -hmm. the creation story in genesis one yeah and in a different order mm -hmm. and there's no day eight that's mentioned so it's not immediately after that we have no idea how long after day seven you would have Adam created again in the book of Peter and in, in, in the passage in, in, in second Peter that I'm talking about it and connected into the story is, is that a day is like a thousand years. So if you have the creation of the Nahash or the serpent, let's say in day five, mm -hmm. then there's a thousand years before the people of day six that are created multiple male and female yeah. versus singular of Adam and told to multiply and never were told to put in the garden. And this is just the beginning of the differences yeah. between the two stories is that you have after day six, which is a thousand years. And then you have day seven, a rest year, another thousand years. And then sometime later you have the creation of Adam who is created in a different way. And it's not just more information being added to day six. You cannot reconcile Genesis 2 with Genesis 1. Mm -hmm. Or if you try and mix them together, you have to ignore the fact that the Bible would be in contradiction. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that. I'm a contrarian, but I do not believe the Bible contradicts itself. But if you understand that the gods of the pantheon rule this world, they did during the renewal of the earth, they had opportunity and time to lead the serpent intelligent beings as the head of this world before the creation of Adam and at the top of that world. And they're actually bigger than humans, according to Gnostic accounts, like the size of a camel mm -hmm. in, in height. Um, and that you have the creation of these humans and that between the Nahash and the fallen angels and this time gap of another thousand years at minimum thousand years probably multiple thousand of years that the whole people creation of people in day six are led astray from god you can understand now a restart with adam created for a special 
commission that's going to be created as a resolution to the angelic conspiracy. Again, all stuff that I get into into the new book, even though I cover a lot about day six people in, in the first book. And that all starts to account for Cain met, but he moved east to Eden. Yes. And people will say because this is what your standard you're taught in standard Christian theology is and doctrine is is that well it was one of Adam and Eve's daughters that he met. Okay, well, that doesn't really make any sense because you don't have any daughters created till Adam is at least 130 years old, and it's sometime after that. So you have Cain and Abel created first. Uh, when they do their first fruit offerings as adults, one's accepted, one isn't. That leads, that leads Cain to um, kill Abel and then leaves. Well, there's nobody created at that point. And he gets a wife immediately and builds a city for somebody who's there. And it's already a place that has a name and a location, mm -hmm. uh, implying that there are other people before. So it seems to me that um, the likelihood is, is that Cain takes a wife from the people of day six mm -hmm. to create his son Enoch that he names the city after. Again, I have... A couple of documents on this for people, particularly Christians, if they want to walk through this. And you're going to see that you're going to get down to a point where it's either a second creation or the Bible's in conflict. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it doesn't conflict and that the translation suggests in so many different ways to different creations. And that means there's... There's, there's an accounting for the races mm -hmm. that show up uh, as opposed to a single race. Uh, and then when you get to the flood, you have the wives that were not old where they come from for um, at least the three sons. A lot of people deduce that the wives would come from the Sethian line that Noah marries. But and if, if Adam is of one of those races or the fourth race that's created, then that's one line, and then the other three wives from the other uh, races would be how you get the four races that show up after the flood. Mm -hmm. So it starts to make sense of things, and you don't get trapped into this whole. Well, you're you're you you don't understand anything, and you're believing in fables because there's no way the Earth is six thousand years old. You don't even have to get into that argument if and. It, who cares whether it's young or old anyways, but at the end of the day is, is there's lots of scripture that suggests that the standard dogma is more of a human understanding than what it was actually written in the original Hebrew. I can't completely agree with you. I mean, that, that, that to me makes perfect sense. Like I, I don't feel like there's any contradictions with that story. It, it answers the questions. The immediate question as well, you know, like I said, where would, where did Cain go? What is the land of Nod? It was a it was a place with a name. It was already a it was an established place. How can there already be an established land with a name if they are the first humans? That it just wouldn't have happened. He knew where he was going and banished. Well, I guess I'll just go to Nod then. Basically, is what he did. And yeah. <laughs> he went there, yeah. took a wife. It's uh, immediately, you know, yeah. and built a city. It's kind of, well, cities yeah. need people to build them and to fill them first of all. And I thought it was interesting. A lot of people don't don't think about it in this this way, but to these people, Cain would have been a god. He would have known things. He would have known the seven sacred sciences passed down to Adam, then to his own children, which would have been Cain and Abel. Cain had knowledge, which these people would just not have understood. But it's simple knowledge to us now. Things like weights and measures. To us, that is such a basic concept. But to those people, these, these uh, I suppose you would call them nomadic peoples who kind of were in tune yeah. with the land in a sense. The concept of measuring or weighing something or ownership or borders or divisions would have been an alien concept until Cain came along and then divided things up and says, this is yours, this is mine, that is yours. This is the first introduction of true corruption into humanity. This is greed. This is where pride and envy comes from. You know, what I want what he has. My land is not as big as his land. Now we have measures. It's basic stuff to us. But then this guy was a, was a, a god to the to the peoples you know and i think he was treated as such as well and so it was over his offspring such as enoch you know and these people became rulers and kings very quickly you know but i'll let, yeah, I'll let you carry on with that but go ahead 
and having that status level even before the knowledge of the gods or the illicit knowledge from heaven, as the Book of Enoch talks about, merged into with those seven sacred sciences mm -hmm. that developed to a level of technology that we don't have today that we're just starting to catch up to. Mm -hmm. And so what's also interesting is, is that what meshes really, really well with the antediluvian age of Cain and him going to Nod and to Samaria is it meshes perfectly with the transition from hunter and gatherer to agrarian. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the language in the original Hebrew, you, you, you get glimpses of it in English as it's translated. Trouble is, with, and it's not that the Bible translations are bad, it just doesn't always encompass meaning and the whole concept as they translate out of Hebrew. But they're talking about Adam writing, and then he gets Eve, a partner sometime later, um, uh, because no adequate partner could be found. That's kind of an odd comment. Again, I'll just leave that for people to read into more into that chapter because it's really, really important. But he is operating from the Nile to the Euphrates. Mm -hmm. This massive agricultural complex of raising crops and orchards and uh, domesticated animals of all different kinds. And he would require significant knowledge provided from God or in the polytheist version, the gods to run this. And that this is the knowledge that passed on to Cain who passes it on to the hunters and gatherers. Mm -hmm. And that timetable, both biblically and uh, through the secular level, merges very, very well uh, with um, the introduction of the agrarian societies. Fantastic. I mean, there's, there's quite a few things that I'd, what ways I'd like to go from here because this story is vast and it goes on for a long time. But there's one uh, book which was released in 2019 by the Vatican. Now, I, I don't know what you think or feel about this book. I'd like your opinion on it. But there's a book called The Book of Lamech of Cain and Leviathan. Yes. Okay. I've, that, read it. I, I've read it too. And it, it gives some fascinating. I don't, I take it all with a pinch of salt, you know, because um, you just don't know about the sources of this. But it explains yeah. some very interesting things. And um, one. Interesting thing I took away from it, never mind we're talking about Noah's wife and who she was, but we're talking about even Lamech from Cain's lineage didn't know who Cain mated with to create all the people. Even he was confused in his time, generation, like six generations, seven generations down, you know. I think it was just before the seventh generation, the curse was supposed to be lifted, which was the mark of Cain, and he was that last generation. And he wanted to know, well, first of all, why do we all have leprous white sick skin which fits into my nephilim look like clowns theory by the way i'll just quickly slip that in yep. there you know but uh yeah it he's confused he goes on a quest to discover who did cain mate with to create us if adam and eve even he didn't know the knowledge the level of knowledge by that generation had been so corrupted and occulted that even him himself a direct descendant of cain was confused about where all these people came from the knowledge was hidden suppressed done within six generations from from adam you know and he goes around and he doesn't like the answers he gets he gets answers from people and he murders them after hearing it the thought that he is the product of 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 a human that wasn't created from adam of cain mixing with these other people he yep. didn't like that yep. idea from the set if we fit in your theory he didn't like that answer that you're giving right now he, he, didn't, he never says what the answer is in the book of Lamech. Yeah. He never mentions what he was told, but it, w as soon as he was told, he got Leviathan, his lizard pet, to eat them. You know, And it's interesting. What do you yeah. think of that? Yeah, and what happens afterwards is, is you have the creation of the giants in the book of Lamech as well. Mm -hmm. So something really interesting is going on. And in other versions, you actually have Cain marrying Lula Lilith. Mm -hmm. which is the uh, daughter of Lilith, one of the queens of heaven, um, and creates a bloodline, a royal dynasty from there. And so you're, you're, you're down to Cain marrying with fallen angels or you're marrying with day six people, mm -hmm. or maybe both. Um, well, he lived for a long time. <laughs> who knows? You know, I mean. He, exactly. And, and yeah. who was he afraid of? Well, well exactly. And, yeah. It's defined in the book of Lamech of Cain that this mark is that pale white skin, mm -hmm. this leprosy look. That's the mark. 
Um, and that's how people would recognize them and that it would somehow distinguish him mm-hmm. that uh, he is of the angels mm-hmm. or of the authority of God, I guess, as biblically as, as you would put on it. So, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it also talks about, I mean, it's a fascinating read in there, but there is a hidden history that it has been protected throughout the, the mysteries throughout history that they don't want to get out. So even with what we're able to sort of glean into it, there's probably even more going on there mm-hmm. than, than what we suspect. And why would, and, and again, biblically, we're not told what that mark is other than it's the Hebrew word oath, which means some sort of sign and authority. Mm-hmm. And it's similar to, you know, you like get an oath as in a sworn oath or like the blood that's painted on the sills and the jams of the time of Exodus mm-hmm. as a sign, but it's it's not that, but maybe it's that ruddy skin color as well that sort of is combining in there where you know, that's white and red, just as Noah is described that way and mm-hmm. just described what giants sort of looked like with that that very pale LB Jen's type of skin. Mm-hmm. I think he's it's described that reddish, sort of reddish tinge to yeah, it. I think he was no, Noah was described exactly as having red and white skin. That's what yeah. he says, isn't it? And then his yeah. fa- his father runs off to his father. He's like, I think I've given birth to a nephilim, you know. And yeah. he has this glowing white skin and this glowing golden yeah. hair, and his eyes are glowing, and he's just radiating this divine light. And you know, yeah. as, as the progenitor of the future of mankind, I'm not surprised he had a divineness to him. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily yeah. mean he was nephilim, but what we do know is the nephilim had divine traits such as yes. white skin mixed yeah. with red. And if he describes it as red and white, and that was enough to convince him maybe it's a Nephilim, then yeah. we we can glean from that that the Nephilim too would have had some kind of pale, sickly, reddish thing going on, you know, this white and red mix. So yeah. it's, it's you can leave yeah, well, a lot of information. Go ahead, sir. And that sort of provides for some white skin color after the flood through Noah, right? Mm-hmm. And then with the, the other races through the other wives and... Mm-hmm. As, as how that sort of shows up. But also with Noah, one sort of he presumes that he was gifted additional powers. Mm-hmm. Right? Like what the additional gifts the Nephilim would have from their godfathers. And so I'm not saying that Noah was the son of God, but it's like that. It's like there's some additional whether it's strength, wisdom, size, I mean, we don't know. Um, but there's something that's gifted there, just as that could be the parallel type of mark that was provided for Cain, because he is truly the first son, surviving son of Adam, mm-hmm. uh, who's going to produce uh, offspring going forward, that uh, he would have special recognition and maybe special power or strength or whatever it is to ward off people who would kill him. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, give them a divine mark, and then people, those who are not of divine in that respect, would fear the yeah. repercussions of damaging such a person. It makes it does yeah. make sense, doesn't it? But this is the thing I want to make clear as well for my audience. A lot of people um, go down the race route with this quite hard sometimes, and I think that's the mistake. Yeah. When I describe yeah. white skin, I'm not talking about me or you. I'm talking about yeah. vampiric deathly yeah. white yeah. sickly this is something else this is unnaturally unhuman it, it, this is not human the, white the color that you would see on chinese masks yes theater masks or some of these statues absolutely in southeast china and that yeah. sort of feature and yeah it is it is clearly something distinct from human skin white color. skin of human. yeah it's it not is, that it's, it it's another thing it's it's separate from it's a yeah. it's a divine trait of the Nephilim specifically, it seems, which is quite bizarre. Yeah. And what's one of the other thing that's interesting about the uh, Book of Lamech of Cain is that it's part of the Manichaean giants, mm-hmm. uh, as it allegedly and uh, stated to come from the Vatican to be translated. Mm-hmm. And so the Manichaean Book of Giants is a kind of uh, conflating of the original book of Enoch book of giants with which is different than first Enoch second Enoch and third Enoch this is the fragments that you get from the Dead Sea Scrolls Mm -hmm. 
that had combined in the time or before of Manny, uh, who was a, a polytheist and agnostic at that time, who combined it with the Parsi or the Persian, within the old Persian versions of the same period. And so you have different sort of names and things that are showing up in the uh, in the uh, in the uh, Manichaean version. But this is an extension off of that series of of books. So not that 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 necessarily gives it sort of a scholastic sort of veracity to it, but you start to look at some of the things that line up so well with the other accounts of giants, biblically, Book of Enoch wise, in all the different cultures, and it starts to say, hey, there's at least, you know, a main sort of stream of of, uh, connections there. And in there, it's also that the giants had significant homosexual tendencies Mm -hmm. that uh, still is sort of part of that whole mythos even to this day, which is kind of interesting. Um, And it could be that they just didn't have enough women to mate with. Mm -hmm. And whether or not, you know, I do think that in the beginning, the Nephilim had great ability to multiply in great numbers. But perhaps after the original creation, they can't do so as quickly because, again, as you link into the related book, the lost book of King Og, they have both before and after the flood a fertility issue, Mm -hmm. but not from sort of like a sperm sort of perspective or an ovary sort of perspective from the females, but a lack of females. Mm -hmm. So that Latesta in the Lost Book of King Og uh, is uh, going to have the miracle child yeah. to sort of continue the reproduction after the flood of, of, of the Raphaim. Mm-hmm. I mentioned a term earlier on called the terrible ones mentioned in Ezekiel 32 and Isaiah 14. And terrible ones goes back to the Hebrew word erit and retim to do the male plural, just as nephil is singular for a giant, nephilim plural is nephilim, mm-hmm. seraphim, seraph, same thing, it's it's common. Yeah. And so they would be the eritim as terrible ones as it's translated, but we only get the singular version uh, out of Hebrew in that passage, but it's understood as the terrible ones. Mm-hmm. Now you get all these descriptions of giants, stuff like that, but then you get these two oddball pieces within the Hebrew definition that means infertility and childless Mm -hmm. and that there was an infertility issue particularly and maybe even stronger after the flood or maybe it wasn't really as bad before the flood Mm -hmm. Um, but after the flood the the Raphaim are going to need human females to reproduce with after the flood Mm -hmm. Because they're going to go extinct if they do not. And uh, so it sort of links all of that in and also lays down a premise for the abominations that the Canaanites are going to take in, who are going to intermarry with the Raphaim to produce the patriarchless tribes of the Bible mm-hmm. um, and nations that don't go back to a, a patriarch in the Table of Nations in Genesis 10 and First Chronicles because. Raphaim are not listed in the table of nations. So Rapha is not listed for the Raphaim shown in Genesis 14 and 15, and which is the root word for giants used 25 times after the flood, as opposed to Nephilim, which was only used three times in the Bible and all referencing antediluvian giants, even as it's used in Numbers 1333. And that this, the Raphaim um, are a tribe of giants as they're described and, uh, the War of Giants in Genesis 14 and part of the nations occupying the land that God is gifting to Abraham. And at Merba, who is the father patriarch of the Anakim, mm-hmm. who's also not in the table of nations, tells you none of the giants are listed in there. And then you get these nine patriarchless Canaanite nations. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have Canaan, Heth, and uh, Sidon which are named, but then you have the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, all of these other names that are going to be created who are known as the Shazu, which are hybrid human giants, 
seven to nine feet tall, typically known in the execration text, also known as the Amau and the Shamau from the more Eastern traditions. Um, and they take their eponymous, eponymous names from Raphaim Patriarch. Mm -hmm. That's why their names aren't listed. So in terms of flood survival, we're talking post-flood, uh, pre-flood Nephilim here. Now, what from what I gathered of the timeline is that maybe about 120 years, they say roughly, maybe 200 years before the flood is when the Nephilim were kind of forced to kill each other off in bloody battles and wars as a punishment for the Watchers who created them to watch their own beloved ones, their children, kill each other, basically. And also turn on them and try to kill them in the desire to want to be the only gods around, pride and hubris. The Nephilim weren't the most intelligent of of people, you know. They <laughs> they thought they could kill their own angelic parents type of thing. They were quite stupid. Um, so the, 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 the big ones, the, the original ones, killed each other they were destroyed, you know, quite a while before the flood. But there was that period of time, I think it's the book of Jasher talks about this, if I can remember correctly, um, it could be Jubilees, I think it's Jasher. It's, it talks about the mixing of kinds that happened around 120 years period just before the flood came. And this is human beings mixing themselves somehow with animals or mixing animals together, creating hybrid chimeras such as um, mermaids. The Vinoc of giants. Yeah. Yeah, well. and they see they call them the monsters in the Book of Giants, don't they? So they have the giants, then you have the monsters, and it seems like these were Nephil and Elio that survived. So the big main Nephilim were killed, but their children kind of weren't a part of that original punishment for the Watchers. So there were still lesser giants around, and I, yes. I call these humans who manipulated their DNA faux Nephilim. They're kind of like they're not really Nephilim in a sense, but yeah. you could put them under the category of corrupted beings yes. that have removed from creation. They're unique. They're yeah. unique because they have human animal traits, which the Nephilim didn't necessarily have, such as centaurs, um, the Taurus type people, the half horse, half fish, half bird yeah. people, yeah. you know, and these are entities that could survive a flood. They could swim in above the, above the rain, above the clouds, they could fly, or they could swim within the waters. They're not on the land. So they're not going to get destroyed yep. by the flood in that sense. Could this have been a preparation by these humans who were warned that a flood was coming to manipulate themselves in a way where they could survive the coming judgment? And so first of all, that's one question I've got for you. But the second is, would there have been an incursion of these entities after the flood, which would have created some of these, like I said, patriarchless nations? Or yeah. would they have maybe had genetic information within them from the process which was extracted to introduce the nephilim gene into the post flood what do you what do you yeah. think was the main call because it could be many not just one i understand like yeah. I said up in the pishtim um the epic of gilgamesh a Neph nephilim survival story all the kings by that point were nephilim rulers we have a Nephilim king surviving, so he would have just carried on as normal after the flood, you know. And it does seem like Nimrod helped in many ways. The Nephilim reestablished themselves. He was he was kind of a Nephilim lover. He idolized them. He wanted to be like them. It's possible he did in some way become like a Gibberim in that respect, you know. What do you think happened? I've just thought I've thrown a lot of stuff I in my mind at you. Yeah, the, Can you piece it together in, in a narrative for me? Can you make it cohesive? <laughs> yeah, and I and I do think like Nimrod intermarried with the giants and started a hybrid giant dynasty and bloodlines after the flood. And I cover that in both books. Um, and that passage from the book of Jubilees, I read that more as after the flood. Okay, but I understood that that likely was happening before the flood as well, and we get that from other accounts. So, um, but so I think it was happening on both sides of the flood. Now, if you're going into the flood and you know it's coming, just as in the Book of Giants, the giants go to Enoch and say, you know, can you inter intervene for us and stuff like that, and then people like Gilgamesh from before the flood actually try and go into heaven or, and kill the gods for the flood coming, right? Yeah. They're, they're so upset. So um, now all of that starts to sort of track that they're going to do things in preparation. And it's more than just the monuments that they're going to build to remember that ancient civilization. Mm -hmm. But can they survive the flood? Now, they can get angelic help, which I think is a distinct possibilities, but maybe they took things on 
their own as well that we're speculating here, but and that they found ways on their own as well to have some of these chimera type beings or crossbred type of beings to survive the flood. Mm-hmm. What we learned from the book of Genesis, where you can make us make a uh, an argument for giants surviving the flood and then tagging on to that other beings surviving the flood is, is when you look at the world uh, that is going on, the whole world was corrupted, which is the Hebrew word shakoth. So everything was being destroyed, DNA and manipulated and stuff like that. But God said he's only going to cre- destroy all the beings he created. It says that in both Genesis 6 and Genesis 7. He didn't create the giants. He didn't create these hybrid beings. So you can make a legalistic argument that those beings perhaps on their own or with the help of angels on the earth, off the earth, able to fly themselves into the water, all the different sort of possibilities there that some were able to survive. I also think you can make a good case just as we talk about Gilgamesh story and the survival story, that there's a second incursion going on, and particularly with the Baalim from the Ugaritic text where it talks about that, uh, with the Raphaim, uh, and then the Greek mythology, and again, more sources than that, um, that there, if, if you're going to do the same violations of that after the flood, you probably are going to recreate things like the scorpion beings, which show up in the Epic of Gilgamesh again, after the flood mm-hmm. that were created before the flood so yeah i think there's a distinct possibility that uh, some of these creatures either were recreated or survived or both mm-hmm. i lean heavily more towards second incursion a second creation by the offspring gods it just for me from a christian perspective it meshes better biblically but because we don't have a smoking gun verse after the flood, like you have before the flood with Genesis 6, 4, we only see the giants show up after the flood. Possibility remains open. And I like a lot of people when I look at Genesis 6, 4, where it says the sons of God went to the daughters of human uh, and created the Nephilim and did so again, Mm -hmm. would look at that possibly as after the flood again. But not definitively. No. And or it could also mean uh, many times before the flood they went to the daughters. Or it could mean all of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we just don't have that clear cut first like we do that giants were definitely created as Nephilim after the flood. But peculiarly and something distinct about them, they're called Raphaim. Raphaim. Yeah, someone in my uh, Telegram group recently was theorizing on the word Raphaim why they called something different than they were prior to the flood. And it seems like Raphaim is this strange concept of um, risen from the dead or dead dead healed or the dead ones or a revival or a healing of some kind. Um, it's hinted within the language and the etymology behind it. So it yeah. could be that so they here, are here. resurrected. Well, I'll, I'll let you go, yeah. Yeah, Here, here's how that flows. So uh, it's uh, 7495 is the root word for... Raphaim, RPM, and we see that in the root word as Rapha, R-A-P-H. And in the Ugaritic text, they were known as healers. They could all only heal themselves, but they could heal others. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons why you had to kill them with uh, beheading or something so swiftly that they couldn't repair themselves, either through technology or just through a self-healing capability, but they had that healing nature about us. Rapha 7495 means to heal or medicine, or words like that, or a physician. So like Raphael, an angel, could mean uh, God heals or healer of God. Yeah. So what's also interesting is, is that some of the bloodlines of these kings, Merovingians would be the more most famous of it, who had more of a Gilgamesh type of look with a dark curly hair and dark beards were said to have healing capability as well. So that's part of that shepherd king, fisher king mythos that goes those dynastic bloodlines. Mm-hmm. 
So 7497 is sourced in 7495. And that means a giant or a tribe of giants. Okay. And But they're connected. So just as in the Ugaritic text, and I cover this off in detail in the new book for people, mm-hmm. um, 7497 um, is, is, is Rafa, male plural, Raphaim. Um, they're described in, in the Ugaritic text as these demigod kings, part of the assembly of the Datanu. And they're going to take, and they're warriors, like that's where Giburin comes from. There's a tribe of Gibur, GBR, as it's in the original Ugaritic text for mighty ones. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have these ones that not only can heal, but they're also ruling these dynasties and are able to take people through portals go through portals themselves and take dead ones through portals to the to to the where the gods are living in the underworld. And then there's another word that's in between is 7496, which means a shed in, in Hebrew, which is a she S I D G is with the Tuatha de Danan, and it means a ghost, and it means an evil spirit and a demon spirit. Mm-hmm. And this is their counterfeit spirit part of the name so 74 95 96 97 describes what the ugaritic texts are describing in different aspects that even afterwards when their spirit didn't go to sleep they're being guided to go to uh, through the ones who are still alive to get to to get to the underworld as this bodiless disembodied spirit mm-hmm. so yes it's directly connected and it starts to answer a whole bunch of questions as to why they were so difficult to kill. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, the whole beheading thing. I've heard. Other than there's nice. Well, other than that, I mean, yeah, who can stand against a giant at the end of the day? Obviously, David managed all right. He did okay in the end. So it seems like yeah. if, you have, if you have enough faith. But he didn't you know, leave it with the stone, did he? No, no, he, be, he took the head off and lifted it up. And then, you know, the Philistines he to ran, make, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. to make sure he stayed dead. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the whole, uh, you know, um, the modern zombie mythos comes to mind of you got to shoot them in the head, otherwise they don't stay down type of thing, you know. And yeah. you talk about the living dead here and the Rephaim are, in a sense, the, the resurrected yeah. Nephilim in a way. I mean, could it possibly be someone uh, made a hint um, that there would have been a lot of floating giant bodies around after the flood? And is it possible through the guiding of the spirits from this other world again, the dead ones, the disembodied spirits were re-injected back into remaining bodies. This is another cons, just a speculation, pure speculation, but just yeah. to try and link it's into this idea of, of resurrected or healed yeah. dead ones in some way with Rafa and Rafaim. There's something suspicious about how they got back. find a way to keep the body alive though, right? Well, I guess so. I guess I mean I I don't know how the mis- how the spiritual realm and the physical realm with mystical beings that are yeah. part divine yeah. work. I don't. Yeah. I think this yeah, yeah, yeah the gap it does right? right exactly. But yeah. if they didn't, but if they didn't have their heads severed, mm-hmm. and they had an ability ability to revive, well, dead ones, but then you would have would you would be saying it would probably be. The drowned giants, let's say in this example, who maybe were looking for their own body mm-hmm. first, but would settle for another body if they couldn't find it. Right? Well, well, yeah, I've heard people theorize. The speculation side of that. I, I've heard other people speculate and theorize that many of these chimerid beings that were created after the flood yeah. were kind of yeah. lesser vessels created for the nephilim to re-inhabit that were yeah. compatible, you know, because obviously you can't. It's they can try and possess humans, but it's messy and they're not really compatible and they can cast them out with the right fasting and the right prayers and all that sort of thing. Especially in the modern age with Jesus, we have authority over them. It's not optimal now to possess a human, but it's possible the creation of chimerid like beings are more compatible with the Nephilim spirit in some yeah. respect. And that, that that's why they were created post-flood, so they could have something to go back into. That wasn't quite what they used to be but still something compatible, some monstrous form. And that's just another way they were in some way reintroduced and possibly how well, the modern and, day. And they, they would want to do that because, and, and again, when Jesus comes across these evil spirits, unclean spirits, those two terms are used interchangeably in those accounts with devils, mm-hmm. which is a really bad translation in the King James because um, that's the Greek word, daemon which is the Greek root for demon. Mm-hmm. 
So, and they're used interchangeably and together there. I have a great document on demons too, if people want. And so what Jesus said about these demons is that when they're disembodied, they don't have a place to rest. And they're like in a dry place. They're thirsty and they need a place to rest. The only place they can rest is in some sort of oikotarian mm -hmm. that they have to do a hostile takeover on um, for the most part. I think certainly in the occult world that a lot of the adepts and shamans believe that you can have a symbiotic relationship if you have enough mystical knowledge to control that demon spirit. Yeah. Right? Just like they believe Solomon controlled demon spirits. So I don't know whether that actually happens or not, or it ends up suppressing the uh, the original host or not, but they need to, to interact in the world and have a place of rest. They need to go into a body, preferably a human body. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Uh, personally, I believe this whole idea that if you draw the right sigil or do the right incantation or put enough salt down, you can somehow exert control over a Nephilim spirit. It's just yeah. a lie. I think the Nephilim spirit will allow you to believe you have some kind of control <laughs> over them. If if that's what you feel, you, you know, if that yeah. if that makes you willing a willing vessel, then fine, you know. But I think yeah. truly well, we don't sure. The only authority you have is through Jesus, you know, at the end of the day. Well, and you'll appreciate this. This would be true to their nature as part of the trickster spirit hierarchy. Of Absolutely. The yeah. true God and the demigod spirit. Absolutely. If, if you draw a circle on the ground and you do some incantation, say you can't leave that circle, the demon will pretend to not be able to leave the circle. Like, oh, you've got yeah. me. Um, yeah. you know, but I don't think you have any control over them unless you are filled with the Holy Spirit and have that authority. That's essentially yeah. the only control. The, the, the true power in the world is through that, you know. And um, one thing, talking about false power, and I had another question from somebody on my last live stream, and they want to know, because with the rise of Gnosticism right now, it's, it's big right now. Gnostic thinking is getting extremely prevalent in the modern age. And when I was, when we last talked seven years ago now, um, I was in this truth of culture and there was a predominant Christian faction and then there was the Gnostic faction and under that umbrella came New Age Theosophy and all sorts of other tendrils that went down you know um but since coming back i have found the gnostics have gained a huge foothold over quote unquote truth you know and their their philosophies and ideologies are running rampant right now they they are seriously people take it very seriously because people are looking for truth or looking for answers yep. but we live in an age of pride that they naturally kind of gravitate towards this idea that enough knowledge and no system will get you the ability to save yourself and that's kind of what a lot of people are always aiming towards if not necessarily going down the whole demiurge route of gnosticism yep. where lucifer's the true god and our god is an evil dictator who's got us trapped in flesh prisons you know and um, so one question someone asked me is uh, who was thoth exactly because the Emerald Tablets of Thoth are, are these things people constantly reference all the time. And understanding your book, is this a link to Hermes and Hermes Trismegistus and yeah. the Serpentine cults and the, the occulted knowledge post-flood? Do you want to explain this history so people who might be going down that route have a true context for who he actually was? Sure. You know. Yeah, yeah so if you've got a few things to unpack here. So yeah. um, understand that, you know, Hermes... Trismegistes means three times Hermes or three individuals at different periods in life as that mythos sort of comes together. Yeah. Thoth is a god of wisdom in the Egyptian pantheon and thought to be antediluvian. Mm -hmm. Although some people say he has a counterpart on the other side. Of course, he'd have a counterpart. Is it the same one? Probably not. That's probably another being, but um so thoth becomes a god mm -hmm. through wisdom yeah so it wasn't originally a god mm -hmm. so that's where you start to get into the connections to enoch and enoch received all of this illicit knowledge from fallen ones and the gods and polytheism and in third book of enoch he has his name changed to metatron which is a name associated with AI and stuff like that today, mm -hmm. and the metaverse, things like that. He actually evolves in, in Third Enoch is not a monotheistic 
Enoch. It's totally polytheist as the second Enoch is, or at least been corrupted that way. But he is going to have his name changed in recognition of him being raised up to be angelic-like, even to the son of God status. Mm-hmm. Um, and taken uh, to to that whole level of being. So he becomes a god through that knowledge is what that is saying. Very similar to Thoth. So in, in the traditions, you kind of have um, Thoth the god, you have Enoch, uh, you have Hermes or Harmanes who finds the, the pillars to the seven sacred sciences created by Enoch and takes it to Nimrod. Yeah. Uh, to build Babel Tower and perhaps part of how Nimrod becomes a gibbering giver. Um, and then you have another one that shows up later uh, as the sort of patriarch for alchemy in Egypt. So you got two Hermes after the flood and you've got two characters in the flood. And typically you'll see the Trismiscus with Enoch and two Hermes after the flood, or you'll have Enoch, Thoth, and one of the two Hermes after the flood, and you, your mind starts to go to mush a little bit first because you got four, not three, and how do they, how do they make that work? It's because you're never really told the connection of Enoch becoming like a god in the polytheist belief system, so that means Enoch would be Thoth in that sort of understanding. Mm-hmm. Now, is Enoch around after the flood? Perhaps. Uh, but maybe perhaps more as a demon spirit. But he's uh, he's the son of King. So uh, we don't know whether or not he's a giant mm-hmm. as to who King married. Mm-hmm. Um, or is he just, you know, the descendants of Adam and Cain and a human from day six and through the knowledge, he becomes a god. So again, there's that missing pieces of information that nobody really links. But we do see that connection between Enoch becoming a god, just as Thoth becoming the god, and likely one before the flood, Hermes after the flood, immediately after he finds the seven sacred sciences knowledge, and then later Hermes. So we, whichever way you t- to find the Trismus, I guess it's, those are the different ways you'll find it out there. So- Enochian wisdom, as it's known as in the Gnostic type of thing, is yeah. is basically the the corrupted seven sacred sciences, which come from God essentially, but were then corrupted, used and abused for power and control by Cain's lineage. Enoch being Cain's first child, and it was obviously cults were created, religious establishments and orders were created by Enoch and Cain's uh, lineage going down. And I do believe, obviously, we don't know when Enoch died exactly, but I know later iterations of the family took over these cults and preserved his knowledge, didn't they? So if you want to explain yes. how that happened and what... Yeah, so Lamech um, of the lineage of Cain, and there's two Lamechs, just so like there's two Enochs. Mm-hmm. And again, you have to be careful not to conflate them yeah. as what the polytheists like to conflate it. And so you also, in the sons of Lamech are uh, Tubal Cain, mm-hmm. um, Jabal and Jabal, all and Nama all assigned to part of the seven sacred sciences and the arts and the crafts that they have. And so that is in the Renaissance period of a resurgent of those sciences in the time when the giants are being created. So you see the organizational structure that's coming. And the seven sacred sciences come from Enoch, son of Cain, who takes Cain's knowledge that he learns from Adam and Eden, according to the Gnostics, and uh, the Masons and the Rosicrucians and the secret societies. Yeah. And Enoch takes that and puts it into seven different disciplines mm-hmm. you know, that we know as the seven liberal arts today. Mm-hmm. And then that this knowledge, and particularly with the knowledge coming from the fallen angels, is going to make this knowledge so valuable and powerful they don't want to share it with the mundane humans and or the Sethian line Mm -hmm. so they create mysticism and i call it enochian mysticism or you know the enochian wisdom the 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 cult of knowledge just as gnosticism means knowledge right yeah and as a cult of knowledge Um, and that the secret to develop this seven sciences they develop the mystery schools 
which were educating the elite and did again after the flood. So the same organizational structure that crosses the flood through Hermes and Nimrod mm -hmm. and none of the humans, the mundane are going to get any of this education or anything like that because uh, they don't have the bloodlines. And so out of the mystery schools that develop the sciences, you have the secret societies developed just like on university degrees or university campuses with degrees, which mysticism takes you up through the degrees of that knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, you have all of these initiatory secret societies there, their alpha houses, skull and bones. It's, it's just part of that whole structure. And you have these rituals and black gowns like the Cathars and the Albigensians and terms of your graduation into a degree like an adepthood type of thing so you're initiated into these sciences and the seven sciences were created initially and i'll let people decide for themselves how this lines up with the seven liberal arts taught in university today four major agendas one is to lead people away from god mm -hmm. two is to uh, not give god credit for anything Three is to slander God and degrade God because angels don't do that. They use their demigod spirits, offspring, and humans to do that because they know how powerful God is. And then four, to honor their pantheon of gods that they're worshiping. Mm -hmm. And Cain and Enoch, you know, they accept the pantheon of gods and create this whole religion uh, around them. And if you go into school today, they're doing the same thing. They will not give God credit for anything. Existence, creating anything. Uh, they like to slander God as a fable and a myth. And, and uh, it's designed to lead people away. And then everything within education honors the pantheon of gods, whether it's the architecture, whether or not it is the gods being named on things, mm -hmm. um, they just, they just honor them in everything that they do. So, yeah, you have the sciences that are being developed that is going to develop into the mysticism that um, is designed to what they were trying to do before the flood is, is to recreate immortality of the Nephilim that was taken away, which is why it's important to have that marriage with that illicit knowledge. And they're going to offer the same thing. Mm -hmm. In the end time, they're going to offer some sort of physical immortality, either through soul sleeve transfer with clones or parts that they can add on or transhumanism. They're going to offer that. For, and then they're going to connect that angelic technology to the beast system mm -hmm. that is going to work interdimensionally into the multiverse that they're getting everybody prepared for in the implant system that is going to access a particle that is being searched for like at, at CERN and things like that. And it's an invisible particle that's called the Atma, or the Atman particle, new age, the divine essence mm -hmm. that merges with a particle that you can measure at the quantum level and is the source of all knowledge and spreads that knowledge through all dimensions, all universes, however many they are, instantaneously through quantum entanglement. So now you understand why quantum computing and AI is so important so that they can connect you into that system that is going to do things at the quantum level, uh, at the uh, DNA level, at the gene level, to give you an immortality in the physical world. Men will seek death and they will not find it. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 I can I can see it all. I mean, there's so many... Most of our modern media is retelling this story you just told um, and how they're going to do it. And there's no yeah. one way they can do this. They can do it through transhumanist means, artificial intelligence means, quantum entanglement means. Yeah. The, the, every facet is being explored and you're, go you're going to see some something emerge from the current exploration within the modern sciences which again are just a continuation of what happened before the flood it's the same yeah. agenda never stopped it's been going through the knowledge is the same it's just a, a, the application of the knowledge has been get changed over millennia and time um it's been more advanced at other times less advanced at others depending on cataclysm events and changes god's intervention all sorts of things have happened throughout history but the agenda keeps going from a serpent cult yeah. perspective and you're talking about, you yeah, know, yeah. They, they created these religions. Sorry, I'm just going to quickly. Yeah. 
I think people get confused about what kind of religions they created exactly to take the glory away from God. And from what I've seen, the pattern seems to be, well, as long as you're worshipping the sun or the planets or stars or the earth or trees or any the creation rather than the creator, they're happy. If not literally worshipping fallen angel pantheons of gods, that's fine too. That's fair game. Or worship yourself and call yourself God. We don't care will pretend to be the leader of any of those religions as long as you're on yeah. that path. And that is yes. that is Gnosticism today in all as many facets. There's many ways for it to be kind of, uh, you know, expressed, but it all has its roots in this Enoch, basically. <laughs> it all goes back to one person. It, it does. Yeah. And it's with this religion that sort of crosses the flood. Yeah. And at Babel is the key end time allegory we need to understand because you have Nimrod who's an archetypical antichrist figure over the whole rule of humankind at that time not the giants but humankind of the Noahites before they're dispersed mm -hmm. and you have this universal religion that is imposed on them today and that's the root word for Babylon in Revelations mm -hmm. uh, it goes back to the Hebrew word Babel it's that Babel religion it's the Enochian mysticism from before the flood from a secular perspective, we have Indo-Aryans and four or five groups of these Indo-Aryans, Indo-Europeans, or giants that show up after the flood, whether they survived or well, uh, yeah. <laughs> recreated or both. And the religion of the original giants, and particularly as we trace that to certain aspects of a related group of the Indo-Aryans, and in this case, the dark-haired ones, but they're all part of the same group, whether they escaped out of Tartarus or, 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 rec or recreated. And that religion is Zoroastrianism mm -hmm. that shows up in Persia um, and the Achaemenid kings of the Persian kings and before where they're worshiping Zoroastrianism. And in the Hindu Valley, uh, the Indus Valley of Hinduism, it's the same religions. And so the ancient uh, Persians and the Hindus have the same names of the gods because it's the same religion. It's just a different branch of the dark haired giants that are worshiping this religion of the giants that crossed the flood that was Enochian mysticism. Mm -hmm. Zoroastrianism is the root religion for Gnosticism. It's the root religion for Mithraism, which was the main proponent at the time of the Romans that merged into with a lot of its imagery uh, to Christianity at the time of Constantine. And uh, whether it's Zoroastrianism, Mithraism or Gnosticism, one of the names for the god that's used in all three of these of their head god is the great architect of the universe, which is Lucifer and or Halel, as we would understand that biblically, or as Gadrael, which may be another name for Satan's original name in the book of Enoch. It's all essentially comparative to a dualistic view of the world. It's all dualism in its own right. Yes. Um, Zoroastrianism, it's, 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 you need the good and the light to have that eternal universal balance, which we all have to find within ourselves, that kind of airy-fairy way of viewing things. Yes. And it equates that Lucifer is equal to God, but in the Gnostic viewpoint, God is the evil controller and uh, Lucifer yes. is the freedom giver. And with you know, the two have an interplay of reality for eternity, which creates life in the universe as we know it or some kind of narrative that justifies the evil basically like it's necessary to have bad things because how would you know what good was without the bad type of thinking yeah. you know but it's so corrupted i'll let you go on it is so what's encapsulated in the two belief systems theism or polytheism and all the different pantheons around the world are the same pantheon it's the same religion just with different names for the gods and some different variations on the vernacular and of the rituals, the local rituals, is you have two different points of view, and you also have two different lenses. Mm -hmm. So as they look through this lens, whether you're monotheist or polytheist, and understand if you're looking through a secular lens, you're looking through the polytheist lens because they're leading you away from God and doing everything they want, just as if you were in that religion. Mm -hmm. um, they, are, they look at prehistory through the polytheist lens, and we shouldn't dismiss their accounts. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's going to be different in terms of how they perceive the golden age, as they call it, or the time before the flood, as we would call it, that you know, brought about the flood because it turned to evil. Um, 
and how they perceive what happened through history and how they perceive what the outcome of the end time will be. And that within that understanding is, is you have from a monotheist version, there's good versus evil as in the rebellious angels, but only for a time. And at the end of this age, at the end of, uh, you know, the fig tree generation is all of the fallen angels will go to the abyss prison. Mm -hmm. I mean, not to the abyss prison, I'm sorry, to the uh, lake of fire yep. where Satan is delayed a thousand years. He goes to the pit prison first and then after a thousand years to the lake of fire. And that there's an end to this yeah. good versus evil and there's a victor in polytheism, even though... Uh, they they have to counterfeit everything in monotheism, but manipulate it. So in that version, you have two powers of good and evil that never win. They're in perpetual battle mm -hmm. throughout history that goes on forever, and that they raise Satan up to be the equal of God. Mm -hmm. They don't dismiss God completely at the depth level. They recognize him for for being powerful, but they've been brainwashed by the fallen angels to believe that he's no powerful than what they are, mm -hmm. uh, even though the fallen angels would know differently. And so they believe that this will just go on forever. Yeah. And that they also have that dualism within their religion. Mm -hmm. It really confused people, and it does a great job because you have black magic and white magic yeah it's the same mystical uh knowledge they have good nephilim and bad nephilim they mm -hmm. both worship the same pantheon of gods today we would know that better and have like black witches or evil witches and white witches and mm -hmm. it's it's there all of the time and we know that today in their code language is the white hats and the black hats mm -hmm. and in, in this case the white hats and the good have humankind's interest at their best you know to not completely destroy them but the end is still the same thing because that's what they intend to do they just treat humans nicer in the meantime mm -hmm. the dark cats have no use for humans and would like to destroy them instantly mm -hmm. they have the same agenda it's just a different way of getting there well in in the truth of culture uh, that i'm a part of um and obviously yourself there is this this idea of you know you, you awaken you wake up first before you start going down the rabbit holes of learning thing about the nature of reality and a lot of people fall into this concept you know that there's um all knowledge is being revealed kind of now in this time and it seems like there's like this this play going on where it said it's kind of like the good occultists are revealing the truth against the bad yeah. occultists you know is that kind of gnostic way of thinking about things really really common and really i kind of see it everywhere and this whole great awakening thing and uh, the yeah. act as though a waking up will save you and that's not the case that's kind of again you're falling into the same false doctrine and idea it's kind of like you know you've got the uh the the false light of lucifer basically fighting against the evil yeah. darkness of satan it's kind of this this interplay of good versus evil again it's it's the same principle the, the truth of the matter is you know you can only be saved through jesus christ it's, there's no great awakening that will save you knowledge will not save you and that's kind of the message christians keep trying to say over and over again and um, but this this you get these people who are awake and then you get people who are actually saved there's two then they are not the same thing they often get conflated with one another as well and um, you see a lot of christians as well who backslide into this way of thinking when you know I don't know if they lose their salvation, probably not. I don't know if this, if it's once saved, always saved, but there's got to be something to be said for turning your back on that pr that promise, that gift, to then go seek knowledge instead. There's got to be something about that, which I assume the enemy would enjoy you doing. You know, <laughs> that's kind of the, the goal to funnel you down yeah. that path, you know. Because once they create that wedge in faith, they've got you. They don't care whether you fully convert or not. Yeah. That's what I mean. They're just there to they're just there to destroy us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I had so many things I wanted to say, but as as you know, these things go, they slip your mind because more ideas just come come in and, and go. Yeah. But uh it, it's a fascinating subject to talk. I could talk about it for hours, just the the state of the truth movement and this this yeah. insidious Gnosticism that is just really it's really gripping people right now, Gary. Like they really 
people crave knowledge more than ever now i think and I, I can hardly blame them in a sense because of just how much we've been lied to and there is kind of a revealing of all things going on but i would say it's extremely orchestrated you know and there are there are paths that have been created for you to go down by these people yes. and you you need to not fall into this gnostic way of thinking is, is kind of my message i don't know if you want to have any closing thoughts yourself we've hit the two hour mark now so maybe it might be a good time to uh wrap this up slowly yeah. closing thoughts and tell people is is that i'm not necessarily here to convert you to christianity although i would i'd like you to choose that what i would do is is you know maybe you know and maybe today we've planted some seeds mm -hmm. but what i would want everybody to do christian or otherwise is find out why you believe what you believe and choose because a non-choice is still a choice mm -hmm. and what they've told you in so-called secularism or agnostics or it you know if you don't make that choice you're you know you're not part of either side but you are because you're either you know with god or not or you're either with um, satan or not there's there's the two sides and you have to learn for yourself as to what what you believe and then be be comfortable with that I would look for more in that pursuit was what makes more sense in the world. Mm -hmm. And why are they always lying to us? Absolutely. And that everything that is promised that leads to utopia only learned leads to destruction. And we've seen that throughout history and we're going to see that again. Mm -hmm. That they don't have humankind's interest at heart. They have their spurious spark, their Spark of the divine of the Nephilim and the Raphaim, as they like to say, in mind. Mm -hmm. There's no room for humans in the New Age or the New Atlantis. No. If there is, it's only for slavery and rituals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, uh, so I did you'll just... You'll never be part of it. No. I, well, on that thought, I did just... You reminded me of what I wanted to say. And it's the idea that a lot of these du dualistic religions, especially reincarnation religions, religions that tell you that you don't die once and sleep, as Christians understood to be, you keep coming back in some endless soul cycle. Okay. Now, actually, I do believe there's some truth to that religion for the Nephilim. That's their religion. That is what they have to deal with as a reality spiritually. You know, they never die. They constantly recycle their soul back into another vessel after being removed or that vessel dies. They reincarnate consistently. And what they've got people fooled into doing is to believing in their religion and their reality spiritually as as a human reality. And that's that's a, a real insidious lie when you think about it. And uh, do you have any thoughts on that idea <laughs> just as a closing thing? Oh, absolutely. I agree with you 100%. And that it's problem on reincarnation so that you can move forward backwards on that chain but it's always this pursuit that even a lowly human could become a god down the road yeah uh, over how many ever generations ideally what the mystical religions are it's for the demigods and it's for them to get to where their gods are ruling from and to be like gods there that they believe they would be doing that forever but of course that doesn't happen. So now they just get into the cycle uh, of deceiving humankind. But within the mystical religion, that's why they have all of that knowledge and rituals at the top so that they're led to believe that they can get to the polytheist heaven. Mm -hmm. It's known by a thousand different things, whether it's Valhalla or uh, the, you know, Anwin or um, the underworld. It doesn't really matter. It is the same belief system. So they're there to, to lead humankind away from God. So we are not going to be resurrected to be like angels. Mm -hmm. And ultimately to judge those angels who committed crimes against us, as, as we're told in the New Testament. So the demigods are, you know, they had their ability to make their choice while they were on earth. Once they become disembodied spirits, they're already condemned. Mm -hmm. And they're going to the lake of fire as well. Absolutely. And so they only have one agenda, just as since the resurrection that the one angels didn't anticipate. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus and ensured that they had, as the book of Corinthians talks about. 
they only have one choice after that point in time mm -hmm. is just do as much damage as they can. And if they can, maybe bring upon the end time before it's ordained time. That's their only hope. So that would discredit God in some way, maybe make a legalistic argument to have a realm on their own. I think they know that that's fallacy. Uh, and, but also note, it, note that the fallen angels never come out and besmirch God. They know how powerful he is. They use their followers and their spirits offspring to do it because they're those, those are the beast spirits mm -hmm. um, that are in this world and the source of the Antichrist spirit. Yeah, well... The they are sneaky like that, aren't they? They're very clever. They're not stupid. I think a lot of people need to realize, you know, these these angels, um, especially seraphim angels, were at the right hand of God. They were right there next yeah. to him, you know, that since the, not since the beginning, since their creation in the beginning. You know, they, they've been there um, and they, they know the rules and they play by the rules, even though they are after their rebellion, they know better than to push it even further than they already have type of thing. Uh, so like I said, if they can get you to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, then that that's that's the way forward, isn't it? And um, one, one final question. This is another one that I reminded somebody asked me, and we'll make this the last topic. Um, but people have wondered and asked many times to me, was it possible there were good Nephilim? Yeah, I think so. You think so? I think so, and uh, well, sentient can, beings. Can they, or if that's the case, then can they be saved in a sense, or can they be redeemed or avoid the the end punishment or the annihilation from existence because of their corrupted nature, as though they should never should have existed? Can they be forgiven for that? Um, how do I think they can. If you if you're born and you don't have have that choice you're born whether you're human or you're nephilim or a hybrid um, those sins of the father don't necessarily pass on yeah and if they do they don't pass on to the, past the fourth generation mm -hmm. as the book of the law talks about in in hebrew so that um, you will not be held accountable for things you inherit innocently mm -hmm as opposed to willfully. Yeah. So every being, angel, Nephilim, Raphaim, whatever hybrid, humans, I think has the choice to choose God. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And if so, one deduces that if they did that, they would do good things and they would, uh, they would be saved. They would be hated of their people, you know, the, uh, their counterparts of their peers and probably hunted down and killed, but mm -hmm. it certainly is possible. Now, do we get examples of that biblically? And I would say yes. Mm -hmm. So we have in the time of the Exodus, you have Havim that are also called the Gibeonites or the Gibeonim as I call them in the new book. And some of the ones of the city of Gibeon, which is one of the most powerful fortress city-states of the whole military structure of, of Canaan at a time and, of, and of giants, they make deceitfully a treaty with Joshua. Mm -hmm. And of course, Joshua finds out that they're not foreigners, and uh, but he's made that oath. So you have to stand by that, that oath and that treaty. But they become church servants and slaves of the temple. Mm -hmm. And so one deduces then that they're permitted to do so because they're there even to the time of the first and second temple as a bloodline of these. Uh, and that they're called the Nethanim in uh, the time of Solomon. And, and then in, as they, you get uh, the descendants coming back after the Babylon dispersion. Mm -hmm. uh, that these are the bloodlines of a Raphaim tribe that made a treaty and that they become scribes. They become uh, things that are doing for the good of Israel. Otherwise, you wouldn't be allowed in the temple. You wouldn't, I mean, there's no way that that would be accepted within the inner confines. You also have in the time of David, the mighty men of David. Now, that's 
the Hebrew word Gabor and Gubarim as well. And I'm not saying David's men were all Gubarim because they're mostly Israelites. Mm-hmm. But you get three or four that are the hybrids or Raphaim. So you get one from Maka, the Maka theme, which is a Raphaim. You have Uriah the Hittite is another example. And you have other examples of people that are fighting with David um, as well, like uh, that are described as these Gibberim and these mighty ones that would be more attributable to being giants. And by the names, both a Makathim and a Hittite would be giant and hybrid, respectfully, in terms of how I stated that, just as the lion-like men of, of Gad mm-hmm. uh, or wilderness men and Gibberim as well. And again, you have the same language that goes with the lion-like men of, of Moab as well. These are Nephilim. They're a different kind of Nephilim or Rephaim after the flood, just as Arioch is part of the giant kings of Mesopotamia and the giant wars of Genesis 14. That, mean, that name is mean lion, means lion-like. Mm-hmm. And it goes back to, uh, I talk about this in the book, but that's too long of a rabbit trail to go down here today. Mm-hmm. But we get this understanding that if they're fighting with David, not killing David, to eliminate bloodline to produce the Messiah that they probably converted. Mm -hmm. So I think what it takes is just faith in Jesus, faith in God, and to manifest that. uh, Because I think, I know it's only faith, but I think if you have faith, you have, you will naturally manifest that spirit of faith uh, into good things. So, Mm -hmm. uh, and in align with uh, God and Jesus. So I think uh, yes, they can be saved. I think it might be rare. Mm-hmm. I think it may be very difficult with the influence and the DNA and all the other brainwashing that goes along from your birth. But everyone has a choice. Yeah, that's the thing to remember. That that makes sense to me. I mean, I think, like you said, it sounds like to me, it, it's difficult for them to break their nature, in a sense, yes. because of because of what they are. It feels like the whole evil continuously in the heart thing is something they can't really, it's in them in a sense. So they often yeah. go on to do things which are unspeakable and awful and very much revel in it naturally and very seldom repent from that and would probably not, you know, and, and I'm not saying like, it seems like it's uh, the exception, not the rule, but some of them do seem to be able to, you know, second guess their own decisions and choose to go to the side. the exception even with the descendants yeah i mean there was exception. yeah there's an example in the book of giants isn't there um, you know where they, they get news about what's going to happen to them and yeah. then they decide to be repentant you know yeah. and then they're desperate for forgiveness you know and realize afterwards yeah. the horrible things they've done and the mistakes they've made so it's not like they are incapable of realizing that they're doing yeah. bad things you know and can distinguish and there's uh, yeah, a sorry go ahead go ahead i would also say one thing is is that when it comes to salvation and judgment i try not to tread on the domain of god and jesus and the holy spirit that's their decision yeah and, um, but i know what we're told and I also know there's a passage in the book of Romans where it talks about even if they didn't know about Jesus, they didn't know about God, they have this consciousness and whatever they believe in their heart to be right, mm-hmm. they'll be judged against their actions against that. Now, that means there's a possibility then that even they could be saved. Uh, but I'll leave that up to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. That's not for me to decide, but it's an interesting passage. Now, that's that's the white throne judgment at the end of time, isn't it? I suppose that's yeah. that's for that moment. Yes. It's not for us to to be involved yeah. with. Um, and yeah. just there's one passing thing that I kind of remembered as well is, um, you know, we're talking about these dualistic religions earlier, and it made me think the very original sin was eating that fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it seems like it's the idea of, as soon as we became aware that there can be a dualism of good and evil, that's where our ability to be corrupted came in. People can play. It seems like the angels played on that, didn't they? And now that we're aware of the duality, they made us believe in a divinity behind it, or they created false religions based on the duality of good and evil, yes. making us forget the original thing we knew before eating the tree, that is God. 
and there's good, you know, and then there's being away from God, which is digressing into evil, essentially. Yeah, there's not an equal. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that 100%. And they were promising, Satan was promising through the serpent, you can be like God with this knowledge of both good and evil. Yeah. And, uh, that's part of what they're going to offer in the end time. And what we also got to remember, and that's the root to Gnosticism, the fact that in Gnosticism they call the tree of Eden of good and evil uh, to be the tree of Gnosis, the tree of knowledge, of complete knowledge. Knowledge can be used for good and evil. It's, knowledge isn't evil, it's how it's used. Okay. But what Adam and Eve forgot or didn't think about enough is, is by doing that, they no longer had access to the tree of life. Mm -hmm. so they got the knowledge they did they then lost their eternal life and so this world had already been corrupted by fallen angels and even though sin wasn't imputed until the first law was put in with don't eat from the tree of good and evil mm -hmm. so sin enters into the world and um, when adam and eve left they are now swimming in the sea of corruption mm -hmm. And even Israel is an island in the sea of the Gentile nations. Like it, this world is run by them. It is completely corrupted. It leads everybody astray. I even think in a physical form it affected fallen angels to a certain degree because it, had, it was that corruption of the physical body in the physical world that corrupted their spirit to, to do horrible things. So all of those things we have to keep in mind as to what they're promising mm -hmm. and, and, and you get the allegory in a lot of the things with trying to do a deal with satan yeah right you think you made the deal but he gets you in another way mm -hmm. that's the world that's what they offer well i think we'll that's a good place to end it there gary yeah, th thanks for this it's been amazing um do you want to just leave your information of where people can find your book where they can find more information about you and then we'll uh, we'll end it there so the best place to get a hold of me is through my website, um, the Genesis six conspiracy.com. That's Genesis six, the number six conspiracy.com. And on that website, if you go to the media page and it says contact Gary Wayne for an author, that's my email address, Genesis six conspiracy at gmail.com again with number six. And I'm with the revamp of the uh, website. It'll be a easier contact the author location um, but that's why you get all of me right now it's under revision right now and on the website today if you want to get a copy of my book you can uh, get a signed copy so if you're in the u.s there's a u.s page if you're in canada there's a canadian page anywhere else in the world there's an overseas page you can order a book directly from me you can also link over to amazon to get the kindle version and over to amazon.com amazon.ca and barnesandnoble.com so that's the easiest way to sort of link over and find the book as well if you wanted to buy it from another source and i have a generous excerpt of all 98 chapters for the first book and right now as of this week there's a generous excerpt of all 84 chapters of the new book uh, so you can get a good feel for the table of contents and what's in the chapters and uh, that will be available through the website and the same sources as the other books so the new book will come out hopefully before the release date uh, march 12th it's just a printing issue so i'm hoping to have books as soon as the bottleneck gets through the bottleneck and yeah. uh, so i may have uh, hard copies before amazon does i know they've got a release of march 12th but they may introduce it if the book comes available sooner and you know the kindle version who knows amazon might release that sooner because it's already in digital format well, I'll be buying myself a Kindle version for my own research purposes because uh, it's easier to search references and keywords when it's on a laptop for me, for my own. Uh, but I'll definitely be buying my own copy, uh, Gary. But thank, thanks for this. It's been wonderful. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone for listening as always. God bless. I want you to get together.